Everything about the Great Britain was gigantic. Its pistons were more than seven feet in diameter. This was a Brunellian nut and bolt, and you should see his idea oh, of a spanner. Look at that. God. Sadly, though, the Great Britain was destined for a pretty miserable life. On just her fifth trip to New York, she ran aground off Ireland. People thought the iron hull could have confused the captain's compass, but Brunel had thought of that. It was just bad navigation and bad luck. And there was worse to come. The Great Western Steamship Company couldn't afford the repairs, and to Brunel's horror, she was sold. The new owners used her on the Australia run, but in a vicious storm off Cape Horn, she was damaged and then dumped on the Falkland Islands, where she became a warehouse for storing coal and wool. This was the most advanced ship in the world. And look what they did to her. Letting her rot would be like using the capsule from Apollo 11 as an ashtray. The story does have a happy ending, though, because in 1970 she was rescued and brought home to Bristol. And I'm delighted to say she's now been restored and sits in a permanent dry dock so you can come and marvel at what, in terms of modern shipping, is Genesis. And the extraordinary thing is that a modern propeller designed by a computer in the 21st century is only 5% more efficient than this propeller, which was designed by a Victorian bloke in a tall hat. Guy was a genius. The Great Britain was launched in 1843, the same year that the Thames Tunnel opened. Two astonishing feats of engineering in the same year from the same man, and he was still only 37. At home, remarkably, Mary had given birth to a second son. And even more remarkably, it does seem that Isambard was actually quite a good father. So one day, he was at home doing that old trick where you push a coin into your ear and it comes out of your mouth or your elbow. But unfortunately, it went wrong and it ended up in his lung. Now, most people would have panicked when conventional medicine failed to get it out again, but not Brunel. Predictably, he resorted to engineering and made himself a pair of forceps, which could be inserted through a cut in his throat down his windpipe must have been fantastically painful and rather worrying because the operation didn't work. In desperation, Brunel and his father developed what we would now recognise as a physio table. Isambard was strapped to it, turned upside down and shaken vigorously until, to the accompaniment of much rejoicing in the streets, the coin popped out. And apart from the physio table, he also invented rifling down the inside of a gun barrel, he built Florence Nightingale's hospitals, and he developed an iceberg warning device 50 years before Titanic. You see, the thing is, Brunel always built everything for a reason. Which brings me neatly on to the dome. In many ways, I suspect he'd have loved this place. He'd have loved the size of it, that's for sure. The sheer scale is very Brunelian. He'd have loved the extravagant use of other people's money too, but most of all, I suspect he'd have loved the engineering. By using these 300-foot-tall steel masts to support a sort of spider's web of cables which then support the roof, the actual structure weighs less than the air inside it. I think we sometimes forget just how clever this place is. However, Brunel would have absolutely hated the pointlessness of the place. If you told him that it was built for a party rather than a purpose, he'd have had a duck fit. The problem with the dome is that we had nothing to put inside it. 
It's a far cry from 1851 when we built the Crystal Palace to show off all the innovations that were powering the empire ahead. Brunel was on the committee, of course, but he had very little to do with it. His main preoccupation at the time was a mile down the road. The crowning glory of the Great Western Railway. Paddington Station. Today, you're distracted by the shops and bars, or you're glued to the departure boards, wondering if your train's been built yet. But don't be distracted. Look up. It's breathtaking. It's beautiful, but totally functional. The planet and star shape holes on the ribs, they were places where you could attach cleaning gantries. And these pillars double as downpipes to let water run off the roof and drain away. And now you can board the train to Heathrow, Paddington has become London's gateway to the world, just like Brunel planned 160 years ago. Did he know Paddington would last this long? I think so. There was an air of indestructibility to everything he built. This is the Royal Albert Bridge. Brunel built it to carry trains across the Tamar estuary between Devon and Cornwall in 1857. It's still doing it today. When it was built, it was amazingly advanced, like something from the space age. And it's still a very clever piece of structural thinking. You see, on a conventional suspension bridge, like this one, you build a tower like the one I'm standing on, on one bank, and then a tower on the other bank. Then you sling a couple of cables between them and hang the roadway from those cables. Then, to stop the weight of the roadway pulling the two towers into the river, you have more cables going down the other side, which are anchored into solid rock. Now, Brunel's bridge is also a suspension bridge. If you look, there's the uh, railway part is suspended underneath those flat grey bits there. But, and no one knows why, Brunel didn't tie his towers back. Instead, he used those great big tubular metal things to push them apart. I like to think it's because he could. So what's gone wrong with engineering in Britain today? Well, there's the usual reasons. Engineers aren't paid enough, we don't respect them enough, and engineering projects tend these days to be run by accountants. But there's another reason. Brunel. The man was so prolific that by the time he'd finished, there was nothing left for anyone else to do. And there was no point hanging around waiting for all his works to fall over. Because think about it, Paddington Station, the Box Tunnel, the Clifton Suspension Bridge, that, they're all still here. Most people are remembered by a little blue plaque on a crummy house somewhere because whatever it was they did has long since faded away. But we're reminded of Brunel wherever we go by his huge ironworks that are held together with rivets the size of fists and, and, and bolts like Volkswagens. When he built stuff, he built it to last. Mm -hmm. 